Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over How to Be a Stoic by Massimo Pellucci. Now this is a really great introduction to Stoicism. Specifically we're going to be talking a lot about Epictetus inside of this book. And with that I don't want to waste any time. I've pulled out what I believe to be the most important points from this book, including two yellow points, which I think are the things that if you read this book you would want to take away. With that, let's get directly into our introduction, How to Be a Stoic. The first quote that I pulled out of the book to give us a good overview of what we're expecting to learn goes like this. So let us explore Stoicism together in a running conversation with Epictetus via his discourses. We will talk about subjects as various as God, cosmopolitanism in an increasingly fractured world, taking care of our families, the relevance of our own character, managing anger and disability, the morality, or not, of suicide, and a lot more. Other Stoic authors, both ancient and modern, will occasionally supplement what we learn from Epictetus, and sometimes I will gently push back against some of our guide's notions. Bringing up advances in philosophy and science over the intervening centuries since this was written, and debating on what a modern take on Stoicism might look like. The goal is to learn something about how to answer that most fundamental question. How ought we to live our lives? It's a very deep philo philosophical question that, of course, we're going to be going about answering in this mind map as well. The ancient Stoics developed a philosophy that has lasted for nearly two millennia. These people were from a much different time than us, a time before cars, cell phones, and social media. One might wonder, how could the philosophy these people developed possibly have relevance today? Well, the human condition, if you think about it, really hasn't changed all that much. We all seem to be dealing with the same things as the Stoics dealt with back then. Dealing with fears and doubts, dealing with wants and needs, and dealing with each other in society. Some of the things that Massimo points out we'll be learning inside of his book. Stoicism and its teachings has been among the things that I am thankful more for, for the most in my life. Now, this is something that I've just recently got into, but the teachings of these philosophers has really helped me get through some tough times. Business dealings, relationships, distractions, and cravings. It also taught me to be more grateful and thankful for things. People around me, life itself, and the sheer time that I have here on this planet. Those are just some of the things that I feel like Stoicism and the Stoic philosophers have been a really good at teaching us how to deal with, how to think about, and of course that fundamental question, answering it ourselves. How ought we to live our lives? With that, we're going to get directly into the other main points that I pulled out of the book. But first, let's talk about mind mapping. If you're new here, you can get the most out of these mind maps by following along. You can also find the process of how I mind map, plus all 50 plus mind map templates, including this one, at the link in the description down below. Following along will help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. And with that, we're going to get into Crippled Slave, our first point coming out of the book. What a remarkable figure Epictetus was. No? A crippled slave who acquires an education, becomes a free man, establishes his own school, is exiled by one emperor but is on friendly terms with another, and selflessly helps a young child near the end of a simple life that will continue until a very ripe age, especially for the time of 80. Oh, and most importantly, who utters some of the most powerful words ever spoken by any teacher in the entire Western world and beyond. Those are strong words coming from Massimo about uh, one of our teachers today, Epictetus. Epictetus is the perfect guide for our journey, not simply because he was the first Stoic I happened to encounter, but because of his sensitivity and intelligence, his dark sense of humor, and his disagreement with me on a number of important points which will allow me to demonstrate the remarkable flexibility of Stoic philosophy and its capacity to adapt to the times and places as different from each other as 2nd century Rome and 21st century New York. And I think this is a really interesting point about who we're learning from. Who are you learning from? And I think it's a really great time for us to just stop quickly and take a self-inventory 
see Massimo has done a really great job of picking his mentors, the Stoics, and and I'm just wondering, who are you choosing? Who are your teachers? Who are your mentors? Who are you listening to? It's a great time to stop and take a self-inventory. The fact that Epictetus had such a multifaceted and sometimes difficult life makes him the perfect guide for those new to Stoicism. And why might that be? The first thing I like to look at when deciding if someone is a good mentor is, have they been there and done that? And Epictetus, of course, has been there and done that on things that I can't even imagine. Hardships that he's been through that I don't have to deal with, but I know that he's able to pull some wisdom from. The second thing I look at is, what are their motives? Are they trying to sell me something and should I be skeptical because of that? Now, of course, Epictetus is not trying to sell me anything because he's simply no longer alive. But as well as with the Stoics, they weren't really trying to get you to sign up for their religion for some uh, some reason. They w- didn't even, in fact, have a religion. They had a philosophy. And I think that that speaks to it a lot as well. The third thing that I like to look at is who else has used this information? What do their students look like? And how is this information helped other people. I think that that's very, very important as well. Just because someone can get results for themselves doesn't mean that they can get results for you. So I think it's very important to not only do the self-inventory of who are you listening to right now, who are your mentors, and who are your teachers, but also think about into the future. Are these people uh, trying to sell me something in particular, and should I be skeptical because of that? What do their students look like? Not just what are their results, but what might my results be if I was to learn from this person? And also, have they actually been there and done that? Are you trying to learn from someone who hasn't actually done the thing that you're trying to accomplish? That's very, very important. You need to be looking at these people with a skeptical eye to a certain extent before you start to kind of devote yourself to learning from them. When I read this passage, I realize that I wasn't as stringent with the quality of my teachers, my mentors, and those who I gave my attention to as I could possibly be. Sometimes I listen to people who haven't had a proven track record. I have bought into many different marketing plans from people who haven't actually used those marketing plans before. Almost without fail, that was a complete and total mistake. As an entrepreneur, many of the people who I looked up to in the world are obsessed with wealth and building large businesses. These people can can often sell that they are able to help you with something when they actually have no business doing so. Once, I found a mentor who was a really large business owner. He agreed to teach me what he knew about selling in the business-to-business space. After a few months working with him, I had to stop. Even though he was a great businessman, he was a very, very poor teacher. Moral of the story? Find yourself a high-quality mentor. Someone that you can look up to, but also someone that you can learn from. It doesn't have to be specific and doesn't have a specific motive or something to sell you. And those are the type of people who are going to be our guides today, mostly the Stoics as seen through the lens of Massimo, one of the great Stoic teachers of today. One of Epictetus's crucial points is that we have a strange tendency to worry about and concentrate our energies on precisely those things that we cannot control. So this, again, is one of the most important points, I think, coming from this book and, of course, from Epictetus as well. I called it some things because some things are in our control and some things are not. Continuing on with this quote, on the contrary, the Stoics say we should pay attention to the parameters in life's equation that we do control or influence, making sure that we have embarked on a voyage we really want to make and for good reasons, spending some time researching the best crew, airline for our ship or plane, and making related preparations. One of the first lessons from Stoicism, then, is to focus our attention and efforts where we have the most power and then let the universe run as it will. This will save us both energy and time and a whole lot of worry. So the question that comes to mind when I read this passage is, what are you focusing on? Most of the clients that I see on a regular basis start out our session by venting. And that's a normal part of the coaching process, of course. If you've ever had coaching, that's a very important part, is having someone that will listen to the things that are going on with you. But my job as a coach, quite often, is to simply bring these people back to the moment. There might be a lot of things going on in their lives, of course, there often is, and that's completely normal. 
But just as often, they're focusing on those things that they can't control. And in fact, I when I was reading this, something that came to mind, this was something that happened to me quite a lot. Not only would I focus on the things that I couldn't control, but I would obsessively focus on those things. So I would spend time, energy, life force, worrying about these things that I couldn't control instead of spending a fraction of the time, energy, and life force on the things that I could control to move past that particular thing. So what should we do if we're learning from the Stoics? What should we do? Well, let's turn our attention to the next positive step. What's the next thing that we can do? This is a great way to simplify the complex problems that can sometimes end up being in our way. Just think about what's the next positive step that I can take whenever you find yourself obsessing or worrying about the things that you can't control. Then we go about planning our attack. How can we accomplish the next positive thing? Ideally, as quick as possible. This is a really great exercise to do with yourself. If you're dealing with something in your business, you're dealing with something in your life, you're dealing with something in a relationship or with your health, think about what's the next thing that I can do? What's the very next thing that will move me in a positive direction? And do that as quickly as you possibly can. Ideally, you would pause this video, get up and do that next positive thing right now. Maybe do the next positive thing is watching until the end of this video, though. It might be. Something I dealt a lot with when I was younger, worrying about things like what other people thought about me, what job I would be able to get in the future, what my bank account would eventually be. Most often, if I focus on what I can control, these things seem to have a way of working themselves out. Again, I can't control what other people think about me. I can't control what job I might be able to get in the future. I can't control what my bank account might be. What I can control is who I am. Do I love myself? Do I, uh, do I exhibit the virtues that I want to uphold? Do I have the skills in order to be able to get a job that I might actually enjoy or to start a business that I might actually enjoy? Do I have the skills and the accountability? Do I have the discipline? Do I have the habits that's going to lead to me being able to support myself and my family? You see, I can't control a lot of those outcomes, but what I can control is my ability I can control the skills that I'm learning. I can control my discipline to continue to learn new skills when it comes to career and etc. So those are the things that I need to be focusing on. I heard someone say today that you're, you need to focus on making your world small. Focus on the things that you can control and focus in on those tightly. Make your world as small as you can. I think that's a really great idea, a great visualization. The next point we've got here is four virtues. The Stoics adopted Socrates' classification of four aspects of virtue, which they thought of as four tightly interlinked character traits. Practical wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Practical wisdom allows us to make decisions that improve our eudaimonia, the ethically good life. Courage can be physical, but more broadly refers to the moral aspect. For instance, the ability to act well under challenging circumstances. Temperance makes it possible for us to control our desires and actions so that we don't yield to excess. Justice for Socrates and the Stoics refers not to an abstract theory of how society should be run, but rather to the practicing of treating other human beings with dignity and fairness. One crucial feature of the Stoic and of Socratic conception of virtue is the different virtues cannot be practiced independently. One cannot be both in intemperate and courageous in the Stoic Socratic meaning of the term. Although it makes perfect sense for us to say that, for instance, an individual has shown courage in battle and yet regularly drinks to excess and is ill tempered. For the Stoics, that person would not be virtuous. Because virtue is an all-or-none package. I never said Stoic philosophy wasn't demanding. And of course, it is very demanding. I, I want you to know that, of course, it's all-encompassing, but also, you don't have to be perfect. This is a whole entire journey, as, as life is. And you can uphold 
virtue little by little every single day. In fact, in Donald Robertson's book, that's what he suggests we do. We say, okay, who might I be if I was my ideal sage? Who might I be if I was living up to the highest virtue that I possibly could? And how can I take a small step towards that today? It's a really great way to think about it. The Stoics derived their understanding of virtue from Socrates, who believed that all virtues are actually different aspects of the same underlying feature, wisdom. The reason why wisdom is the chief good, according to Socrates, is rather simple. It is the only human ability that is good under every and all circumstance. So that's very interesting. Wisdom is the only human ability that is good under every and all circumstance. Now, wisdom is quite a complex topic, and I'm sure we could spend an entire hour together just having a discourse around wisdom and what wisdom looks like. But here are some practical exercises for you. Are you living up to these Stoic virtues? It's a good time, again, to do another self-inventory. Think about the last few days, the interactions you've had, the temperance, uh, the temptation for gluttony you may have had, or the fear that you might have felt. How did you show wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice in those moments? Or did you at all? Did you even think about those things? Often this little self-inventory can cause us to feel like we should have done better. But don't beat yourself up. That's not what Stoicism is all about. In fact, I want to take a pause here and tell you that that's not what Stoicism is all about. I think sometimes people can think, you know, Stoicism is a very demanding philosophy, and of course it is, as Massimo points out here. But it's not, it's not a beat-yourself-up kind of philosophy. It's about hold yourself to a higher ideal philosophy. And being nice to yourself and lifting yourself up is a big part of that. But what we want to do instead is to use this exercise to gather wisdom. Just this reflective exercise. Maybe it's a journaling exercise for you, or maybe you're just doing it in your own head. Think about the last few days, the interactions you've had, and how you might have shown these four different virtues. Wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Here's my own personal self-inventory to give you a little bit of permission. The past few days have been very, very busy for me. I feel as though I've just been going through the motion and non-stopping and being still enough to gain wisdom from it, right? So I, I've been just going and going and going and going. I haven't been able to take enough time to just be still and, and step back and gain wisdom from these situations. Lately, I've been presenting in front of large crowds for my marketing business, and I've gained a great deal of courage through taking the actions that I normally fear, which of course is great. Temperance, probably the hardest virtue for me. I have a real hard time controlling my actions with food. But lately, I've been working on this virtue and gaining quite a lot of wisdom. Justice hasn't been a virtue that I've even thought much about before reading this book. But here I am, committing to focus more on it in the upcoming months. So take some time. Write this down for you if that works the best. You can use it as a mind mapping exercise. And if you downloaded my mind map, of course, you can even use this mind map to go through these exercises. That'd be a really great way to go about it. For now, we're going to move on to our next point, our second last point, which is right now. How can I use virtue here and now? I figured this was the next best point that we could do after we've really kind of gone over our four virtues, how we have been using them in the past. Let's talk about what we could do now. Continuing on, he says, for every challenge, remember the resources that you have within you to cope. Provoked by the sight of a handsome man or a beautiful woman, you will discover within the contrary power of self-restraint. Faced with pain, you will discover the power of endurance. If you are insulted, you will discover patience. In time, you will grow to be confident that there is not a single impression that you will not have the moral means to tolerate. I think of this passage as one of the most empowering Stoic writings. Epictetus, the former slave, lame because of a once broken leg, tells us to use every occasion, every challenge as a way to exercise virtue. To become a better human, be, to com, become a better human being, by constantly applying this. Notice how he counters each temptation or difficulty with a virtue that can be practiced. Deploying the Stoic concept that every challenge in life is a perfectly good chance to work on self-improvement. 
that's such an interesting point. Every minute, there's an opportunity for you to flex your virtue muscles. Just like throwing a baseball, speaking on a stage, or wrestling, uh, virtue is actually just a set of skills that you need to learn. Massimo points out here how every minute and of every day there is a chance to flex those virtue muscles, making them stronger and more able to overcome harder obstacles. Thus, we could say that the harder our lives, the more chance we have to develop our virtues, just as Epictetus did. Of course, he had a very difficult life. Think about some situations in your upcoming week that might require you to flex your virtue muscles, then commit to flexing them and growing stronger. Patience. Maybe you're bored at your job. Patience is a virtue. Courage. Stand up for yourself. If your boss is telling you to do something that you don't think is right, stand up for yourself. Wisdom. Time for a tough decision. Now, if you have a tough decision, if you have something that you're thinking about for quite often or for quite a long time and it's kind of weighing on you, see if you can step back. Take some time. Step back and try and use wisdom and and non-emotional attachment as much as you can. Temperance might be not giving into the office donuts, and justice, interacting with someone that you don't like, but seeing them for who they are rather than the person that you really don't like. So here are two for me. I'm encouraging you to try your own. This week, I decided uh, I decide whether to make quite a large change to my business, something that I've been waiting for for quite a long time. The business is likely to be sold, and I'll have sold my second business successfully. Wisdom is coming into play here. There's a lot of emotion around this decision. I built this business from the ground up, and I really, really um, have a lot of emotion around whether I should sell it or whether I should keep going forward with with this business, with this marketing business. It's a chance for me to step into wisdom, not let myself be swayed by emotion, just as the Stoics would do. Over the next few weeks, I'll be traveling and won't be able to pack food with me. I'll need temperance in the face of hunger to ensure I eat in a way that will keep my energy up. Temperance, when it comes to food to me, used to be, uh, for me, used to be, you can't eat that because insert reason and that worked for a little while. But eventually it was way too restrictive. Instead, I've been using temperance in the way that I believe it was designed stoically, which is more like, That food looks delicious. Do I want some of it? Asking myself that question. This gives me the ability to have a portion if I'm truly hungry for it. But it doesn't let me off the hook of temperance altogether. If you have ever struggled with issues around food, I really recommend you work on building this skill. It definitely wasn't easy. But for me, it's been probably one of the most important skills to learn. Temperance. Continuing to learn that temperance of Uh, of course, you know, I want this thing, I want to do this thing. How can I build up my temperance towards it? Now, our final point here is the 12 different exercises, 12 different stoic exercises that you can use. And this is a fascinating, a fascinating list of things to do. Now, this is something that you can plug and play. Maybe one or two of these things will be really great for you right now. But this is something that you could write down or save this mind map on your computer. All 12 of these exercises will be useful to you at certain points in your life. Number one is about examining your impressions. Epictetus exhorts us to practice what is arguably the most fundamental of his doctrines, to constantly examine our impressions. By stepping back to make room for the rational deliberation, avoiding rash emotional reactions, and asking whether whatever is being thrown at us is under our control, in which we should act on it or isn't, in which we should regard it as not of our concern, none of our concern is, uh, none of our concern bit is often misunderstood. The idea isn't that we shouldn't care about what is happening to us, but if truly, but if truly is nothing more to be done about the given situation, then we should no longer concern ourselves with it. We should stop trying to do something about the situation precisely because it is outside of our control. Examine your impressions. That's exercise number one. Exercise number two is remind yourself of the impermanence of things. In case uh, of particular things that delight you or benefit you or to which you have grown attached, remain yourself 
of what remind yourself of what they are that is everything is mortal then you won't be so distraught if they are taken from you life is ephemeral and people we deeply care about may be snatched from us suddenly without a warning we should constantly remind ourselves of just how precious our loved ones preciously uh, preciously because they may soon be gone therefore care and appreciate very much what we have now precisely because fate may snatch it from us tomorrow remind yourself of the impermanence of things number three is the reserve clause some people always assume that of course things will go well since bad things only happen to other people possibly because they somehow deserve them instead of stoics we should bring the reserve clause to anything we do and even use it as a personal mantra fate permitting the reserve clause number four is how can i use virtue in the here and now something that we already talked about for every challenge remember the resources that you have within you to cope with it faced with pain you will discover the power of endurance if you're insulted you'll discover patience in time you will grow to be confident that there is not a single impression that you will not have the moral means to tolerate remember that the goal isn't to live an unhappy and grim life on the contrary it is to achieve what the Stoics called apatheia, means tranquility of the mind, as well as equanimity towards whatever life happens to throw at us. How can I use virtue in the here and now? Number five is to pause and take a deep breath. This one's pretty self-explanatory. He says, as we have seen, Stoics ha handled insults very well, ideally like rocks. The point here is to practice the crucial step that allows us to more rationally examine our impressions, regardless of whether they are negative, such as insults, or positive, such as feelings of lust. We need to resist the impulse to react immediately and instinctively to potentially problematic situations. Instead, we must pause, take deep breaths, perhaps go for a walk around the block, and then only, and only then consider the issue as dispassionately as possible. This is simple advice, and yet is very difficult to pull off. It is also very, very important. Once you start seriously practicing this exercise, you will see dramatic improvements in the way that you handle things, and you get positive feedback from all the others who see those improvements. That was pause and take a deep breath. Next is other eyes. Epictetus reminds us here of just how differently we regard an event has affected other people when the same event affects us. Naturally, it is far easier to maintain equanimity when little inconveniences or da disasters happen to others than ourselves. But why, really? What makes us think that we are the universe's special darlings, or that we ought to be? Accidents, injuries, disease, and death are unavoidable. And while it is understandable to be distraught over them, we can take comfort in knowing that they are in normal order of things. The universe isn't after anyone, or at least it isn't after any one of us in particular. That was otherwise. Number seven is speak little and well. Let silence be your goal for the most part. Say only what is necessary and be brief about it. On the rare occasions when you're called upon to speak, then speak but not the empty one. Above all, don't gossip about people, praising, blaming, and comparing them. Begin by responding less and less talk of empty topic, and occasionally introduce a more challenging one based on what you have recently read or watched that you feel might lead to a mutually beneficial conversation with your friends. That was speak little and well. Number eight is choose your company well. Epictetus suggests that we should befriend with uh, be friends with others who are interested in following virtue and cultivating their character. Our life is short. Temptation and waste are always lurking. And so we need to pay attention to what we are doing and who our companions are. That's choose your company well. Respond to insults with humor. Instead of getting offended by someone's insults, respond with humor. You will, you will better and your uh, vilifier will be embarrassed or at least disarmed. Furthermore, it is always worth asking yourself a number of questions when you are on the receiving end of what feels like an insult. Is this person a friend or someone you look up to? If yes, then it is more than likely that the person is just offering advice, perhaps in a somewhat 
pointed fashion, but with good intentions nonetheless. Even if the person is not likely to be friendly or particularly well-positioned to provide you with constructive and useful counsel, perhaps he or she sees something that you don't. In that case, too, it is worth ignoring the cutting aspect of what he or she is saying in order to focus on what, what it is that he or she may have gotten right and may have eluded you. There is no reason at all why insults, even, uh, e- even when, as such, cannot also be teaching moments. Respond to insults with humor. Don't speak too much about yourself. In your conversation, don't dwell at excessive length on your own deeds and adventures. Just because you enjoy recounting your exploits doesn't mean that others derive the same pleasure from hearing them about you. But just as, uh, just as no one wants to sit around through a slideshow from your latest vacation, no one really wants to hear another person going on and on about himself or herself. It's pretty safe to say that we are not as interesting as we think we are. Speak without judging is number 11. The, the idea is to distinguish between matters of fact and judgments. Just pause for a moment and try to imagine how much better the world would be if we refrained from all hasty judgments and looked at human affairs matter of factly, with a bit more compassion for our fellow human beings. Let's speak without judging. Number 12 is my favorite. Reflect on your day. Find a quiet place in your house and reflect and what has happened during the day. The goal is to focus on the important happenings of the day, particularly those that have ethical balance. Perhaps you had a, a bruising interaction with your colleague today or didn't treat the partner as well as you should have. Then again, maybe you were magnanimous to other or helpful to a friend. For each of these types of occurrences, we, we write a couple of lines in our philosophical diary, add a dispassionate comment that, as we can muster, uh, and if we're grading our own ethical performance that day, and make a mental note of what we learned from our experiences. Journaling is a big, big part of Stoic philosophy. I recommend that you check out Donald Robertson's book on how to think like a Roman emperor. He talks quite a lot about journaling, and I think that that exercise fits really well in there. That was How to Be a Stoic by Massimo Pellucci. I thank you for being with me here today, and I hope to see you in the next video.